So in a previous video, we made this one bit register and it's got a single input, a single output here is the LED and it stores one bit of data. And just as kind of a reminder, uh, basically the interface for this is we've got our input, our output, we've got a write signal, which uh, if this is active, then it, it stores whatever's coming in our input. And we have an enable signal, which when this is active, it sends whatever bit is stored in here to our output. And of course the registers we've been building also have a clock signal, which uh, for, the, for this video I'm gonna kind of sidestep, uh, but just as a reminder, you know, the, the clock uh, makes this a synchronous register uh, because it, uh, even if, or, or when the, the, the write signal is active, it still only reads data at the, on the rising edge of the clock. So it's synchronous in, in the sense that it's synchronized with this clock for, for, for when it's storing data. Uh, but, but for now, just to simplify things, I'm not including the clock here. We'll, we'll come back to that in a future video when we talk more about the actual implementation of our memory. Now, of course, after we implemented a 1-bit register, we then went on to implement an 8-bit register, which you know, we've got a couple of them here. We've got, you know, this is our A register, this is our B re register uh, down here. And it's the same idea. Uh, it stores 8 bits of data instead of 1-bit, um, but we still have our enable signal, we still have our write signal, and then, of course, we have our clock in here as well, which is this white wire. Uh, and in this case, input and output are, are through the bus. So we have our eight bits of input and output. So it's essentially the same idea as our single bit register, input, output, write, and enable, but now we've got eight of them. Uh, so we have our eight inputs, our eight outputs. Uh, we have a write and an enable that uh, either writes a whole byte into, into all of these or enable it outputs the whole byte from all of these. Now, if we wanna build a memory for our computer, basically we can do the same thing and just replicate that 8-bit storage as many times as we, wanna, as we want bytes that we wanna store. So in our case, we're gonna build a 16-byte memory. So we, we could essentially replicate 16, essentially registers, I guess, 8-bit register, 8-bit eight, storage units. Um, and we have a separate uh, write signal for each of those registers. So a write zero will write into this first uh, memory location. Write one will write into the second one. If this uh, write two is active, it writes into the third one, and so on all the way up to write 15, which writes into this last, the 16th uh, uh, byte down here. And you can see the eight bits that make up the byte are connected to each of these, and you know, we'd either, we'd either have one of these enable signals active, you know, one of these 16 enable signals active, in which case we would be reading um, whichever, whichever byte is enabled. So if we have enable one, that's this byte here, this row uh, is enabled, then it would be outputting each of its bits onto each of our eight uh, bit lines. So these, these uh, vertical lines, we can call those bit lines. And then these horizontal uh, uh, rows are essentially our words. Um, you know, each one is a byte, but uh, generally it's referred to as a word um, because it could be a different length depending on the memory. In our case, our memory is, is 8-bit words, but you could get memory that's 16-bit words or 32-bit words or, or so on. And so each of these uh, memory cells, each of these little boxes here is a memory cell. And in our case, we're going to build these, or we're going to, we're going to use something that's very similar to the registers that we used, which you know, at, at its core is essentially a uh, latch which is able to store one bit of data. Um, in uh, you know, practical memory that, that, you might, that you might have in, in your computer, or, or for example, the computer that I'm using to edit this video on, I have 16 gigabytes of memory in that computer. So that would be 16 billion of these rows, essentially, uh, which, is, which is a lot. <laughs> um, I, would, I certainly wouldn't want to build it like this. Um, but you can imagine, you know, the, these, these flip-flops are fairly complex. I mean, you, you know, you've seen the, the one that we built here, you know, six, well, 16 billion bytes, that's 128 billion memory cells. So you wouldn't want to build 128 billion of these. That certainly wouldn't work very well. Um, of course, you know, it can be miniaturized and all the rest, but, but even that is a fairly complex circuit to store one bit. So most memory, you know, the memory in, in my computer uh, that I'm editing this video on, for example, uh, uses, you know, essentially the, the, the simplest way of storing a, a bit, which is essentially each of these cells is, uh, you know, just a, a single transistor and a capacitor. And the, the bit is stored as a charge on the capacitor. Now, one drawback of that is that the capacitor will discharge over time. You know, after a few seconds, it'll lose its charge. 
And so you can only store a bit in here for, you know, a couple seconds at most. Um, but one way to get around that is to have a separate circuit that basically reads each byte of memory and then writes that same byte back into that same memory location. And so you have a separate circuit that's just doing that constantly. It's just going through all of memory, it's reading every byte, and then it's writing the exact same data back to that byte. And so it's refreshing what's in each of those bits. So even though uh, you know, a capacitor could only store that data for you know, at most a couple seconds, because we're reading and writing that many times a second, it's keeping that data refreshed. But because we have to continually uh, refresh it like that, um, this is referred to as dynamic RAM. Um, it's dynamic because if you don't refresh it, you lose the data that's in it. Um, whereas if we used a, a flip-flop uh, circuit or something like we've been building with our registers, uh, as you know, once you store a, a bit of data in here, it stays there uh, essentially forever until we take the power away. So as long as this is powered up, we don't have to constantly refresh this or anything. We store the bit in there, it stays, it stays there. Um, and so this is, if we're using this type of memory cell, uh, that's referred to a static RAM. And that's what we're gonna do for our computer. And it's, you know, static RAM is generally more expensive than dynamic RAM because you need a lot more transistors, uh, you know, there's a lot more complexity to each memory cell in, in static RAM. Uh, it has some advantages, right? You don't have to do the refresh, although that's, you know, fairly easy to do that, you know, certainly in a larger, larger scale computer. Uh, but it's also generally faster. Um, so you see static RAM used in special applications where you need really fast memory access. Of course, we don't really care about speed for the computer we're building. Uh, so, um, you know, we're, we're basically using static RAM just because it's more convenient because we don't want to have to build that, that refresh circuit. So for our computer, you know, easy way to think of it is, is each of these bytes is essentially just like the registers that we've already built. So you already know how these work. Um, the thing that's a little bit weird now is that we have a separate write signal for each uh, of our 16 bytes of memory, and we have a separate enable, enable signal for each of our 16 bytes of memory. And so that could get a little bit unwieldy. Um, so what we'd like to do is be able to encode which of these 16 bytes we're reading or writing from using an address because you can represent a number from zero to 15 using just a four bit address. So the way we can do that is using this address decode logic where we have four address signals and these four bits essentially represent which address, you know, which of the 16 bytes uh, in memory we wanna, we wanna talk to. And you know, the, our address decode logic starts out by you know, basically giving us the address signals, and then an inverted copy of the address signal. So we have A0 and inverse of A0, A1, inverse of A1, A2, inverse of A2, A3, inverse of A3. And then we just have a bunch of AND gates. And so if, uh, if we AND together the inverses of A0, A1, A2, and A3, this AND gate will only turn on if all of these address, addresses are zero. So if it's zero, 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 then this AND gate turns on and our enable zero comes on. And so that would be our enable zero that would enable this, this, this first row in our address, in our memory. If we had one zero, 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 so a binary of one, um, then, then this AND gate wouldn't be on, but this one would be right? because A zero is one. And then the inverse of A1, A2, and A3 is also one because A1, A2, and A3 are zeros. So we have one, zero, 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 then this is, this, all, of, all of these uh, signals is, are on, and so this AND gate turns on, and so now we're enabling reading from byte one, which is our second byte here in memory, uh, and so on. So, you know, enable two is, you know, zero, one, zero, zero, this is essentially what's coming in on our address lines over here. For three, it's one, one, zero, zero, which is binary for three. For four, it's zero, zero, one, zero, and so on and so on, until we get down to um, our 16th byte, which is you know 15, because uh, we're zero based. Uh, and then in that case, if our address lines are one, 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 then this last one comes on, we have enable 15, and that enables reading from our, our 15th row here. And of course, this is for our enables, and because we, we're also anding it with our enable signal down here at the bottom. Uh, and so we'd have something similar for the right lines as well. So we'd have, you know, all of these same things added uh, in, the, in kind of a similar way with, with, our, uh, with our right signal down here instead of the enable signal.
So this is essentially how we would go about building a 16-byte memory. Now, we could do this, you know, by hand and build 128 of these uh, of these individual memory cells. Uh, but now that you kind of have an understanding of how it works, I'm actually going to use a chip that does this for us, and that's the 74LS189. Um, which, if you can't find that, you can also use the 74189 without the LS. Um, if for some reason, that's e that one's easier to find, but uh, if you can find the LS189, that's that's fine too. Um, but this is uh, a 64-bit random access memory, and of course, with 8 bits per byte and 16 bytes, that's 8 times 16 is 128 bits. Um, and this is only 64-bit, and that's because it uh, essentially has a 4-bit. Um, it's 4 bits wide instead of 8 bits wide. But if we use two of these chips, uh, then we'll be able to build our 8-bit, eight, 16-byte eight memory. And so if we take a look at the data sheet here, they have a block diagram on the back of what's going on here. And you can see they have a 16-word by 4-bit memory cell array. And that's, you know, basically what we have here. Of course, we have a 16-word by 8-bit. So they're basically just giving us half of this. Uh, which is fine, because we can use two chips. And you can see they have the four bits coming in, they've got the four bits coming out, and there's a chip select and write enable uh, signals that uh, enable whether we're, we're reading or writing from this. Uh, and then you can see the four address lines, and you know they just have this address decoder as a block. But of course, you know we just went through how that works. This is essentially what that address decoder is doing, or something very similar to this. And so if we look at the, the pinout here, just to get a, a sense of what's going on, you can see, you know, like most of these chips, we've got our voltage and our ground to power the chip. Uh, but then we've also got our address lines, A0, A1, A2, and A3 are our address lines to select which of the rows we're going to be reading or writing from. Um, and then we have our inputs, you know, D1, D2, uh, D3, and D4 are our inputs. So that's kind of coming in the top here. And then we have our outputs, 01, 02, 03, and 04. And something that's uh, a little bit interesting here that we're going to have to account for is you'll notice that our outputs have a little bar over, over them. And that's because this chip, for whatever reason, uh, the outputs give you the inverse of whatever's stored in that memory location. So you know, we're going to have to end up uh, putting these outputs through an inverter because you know we want to store, we want to get the same value out that we stored. We don't want to get the inverse of the value out. Uh, so we're going to have to use some inverter chips to, to sort of re or uninvert these, I guess. Um, so we have our, our inputs, our outputs, our address lines, and then the only other pins on here are this CS, which is chip select, and that's essentially the enable. So whenever it's an inverse signal, so whenever it's low, it's active, um, which means that when that's low, then we're going to get um, data out of our outputs. Uh, so in our case, we'll just we'll just tie that low all the time, and then we'll use a, a tri-state buffer uh, like we have for our other registers, um, and then write enable. And this is also an inverse logic. So when it's low, then it's reading in um, from our from our inputs and writing it to whatever location in memory is addressed from our address lines. And so that's the basics of how the 74LS189 works. And so in the next video, we'll. Uh, uh, wire this up and, and play around with it and, and start to build our, our RAM for our computer.